I'm Charlie Kane, and uh, this week's lectures will be about the uh, quantum spin Hall effect. So this is a problem I started talking, thinking about um, about a decade ago in the summer of 2004. And at that time, there were two ideas in the air. Uh, the first was graphene and the exciting possibility that it could be studied experimentally. The second was the idea that the spin-orbit interaction could lead to an intrinsic spin Hall effect. It occurred to me that these two ideas could be combined, which led Jean Belli and I to develop a theory for the quantum spin Hall effect. Now, the idea is quite simple now that you have an understanding of the integer quantum Hall effect. The integer quantum Hall effect requires a magnetic field which violates time reversal symmetry. However, if we take two copies of the integer quantum Hall state, one for the up spins and one for the down spins, then time reversal symmetry can be restored. You see, time reversal symmetry does two things in quantum mechanics. It takes the complex conjugate of the wave function and it flips the spin. Therefore, a Hamiltonian in which the up and down spins um, uh, are in opposite quantum Hall states is invariant under time reversal. If you apply an electric field in this state, then the up spins go up while the down spins go down. There's no net Hall current, but there is a net flow of spin. When spin is conserved, this spin current defines a quantized spin Hall conductivity. We therefore call this the quantum spin Hall effect. So we started out by considering a tight binding model of graphene with a symmetry-allowed spin-orbit interaction that leads to a spin-dependent second-neighbor hopping term. So this model turned out to be precisely two copies of the model that Duncan Haldane showed you last week. It describes a time-reversal invariant insulator, but since it's two copies of the quantum Hall effect, it must have edge states on the boundary. Um, the edge states for the up and down spins propagate in opposite directions. Um, we call these helical edge states. Though we knew the edge states had to be there, it was a simple enough matter to use this type binding model to compute the um, eigenstates um, in a strict geometry to see them um, explicitly. So the, um, uh, uh, the re result of that calculation uh, looked, um, looked like this. Um, you can see that there's a bulk energy gap um, separating the conduction band and the valence band, but inside that gap are bands of localized uh, states that are localized at the edge. The upspins have a positive group velocity, while the downspins have a negative group velocity. Since there are counter-propagating modes, the edge states are not chiral. They form a kind of one-dimensional conductor at the edge. Now, my first thought about this what it was, is this is really kind of artificial, since it was predicated on having independent Hamiltonians for the up and down spins, which is certainly not what you'd have in reality. The up and, band, uh, the up and um, down uh, uh, spin bands cross, um, and everyone knows that when you have degeneracies, um, uh, uh, degeneracy will be lifted by an arbitrarily weak uh, perturbation. So I set out to find perturbations that would violate the conservation of SZ and get rid of the edge states. But uh, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get rid of them. And uh, so this was a puzzle until I realized that the band crossing here um, was protected by time reversal symmetry. So time reversal symmetry has a deceptively simple consequence um, for states that have a half integer spin. And this is called Kramer's theorem. Every eigenstate of a time reversal invariant Hamiltonian is at least twofold degenerate. The, so the two eigenstates that are crossing um, uh, um, uh, at this crossing here form a Kramer's pair, and that degeneracy cannot be lifted by any time reversal invariant perturbation, even if the, the conservation of spin is violated. So time reversal symmetry guarantees that you have a one-dimensional conductor, conductor at the edge. But what about disorder? Disorder. Um, you know, disordered electronic systems are known to be susceptible to Anderson localization. So in, in, in one dimension, eigenstates are, are localized by arbitrarily weak disorders. So the expectation should be that if you make this edge a little bit dirty, then it should become uh, localized. Okay? The reason for this is that elastic backscattering due to disorder is a, a relevant perturbation. Okay? But um, in the problem at hand, um, uh, backscattering at the edge involves um, you know, uh, scattering from an upspin to a downspin, so it's, it flips the spin sort of like the operator S minus. And this operator is odd under time reversal symmetry. And so the upshot of this is that the lowest order elast elastic backscattering process at the edge is actually forbidden by time reversal symmetry. So for weak disorder, Maybe it's possible to evade Anderson localization. But what about strong disorder? What if the, what if the edge is really dirty? Okay, and, and so um, getting ready for sleep one night, I posed myself the following thought experiment. Suppose you have a helical edge with an arbitrarily long disordered region 
um, uh, in it, but it's cleaned on the, on, the, on, on the sides. So what happens if you have an electron that's incident from the left? Now, this is a classic transmission problem, and you know that there are only two possibilities. Either it's transmitted all the way across, or it's reflected. Those are the only two places that the electron could go. And so the question I asked myself was, what is the constraint that time reversal symmetry imposes on the reflection amplitude? Okay? So that's a question that kept me up for a while. Um, but I was able to convince myself that the reflection amplitude must be odd under time reversal symmetry. And so what this means is that if you have time reversal symmetry, the reflection amplitude has to be equal to zero, which means that the transmission is perfect. Now, um, this got me quite excited. Um, uh, and fortunately, it was still true when I woke up the next morning. Um, what this means is that the eigenstates on the helical edge cannot be localized, even for strong disorder. The helical edge is immune from Anderson localization. This is a sort of a similar situation happens at the edge of the integer quantum Hall effect in the chiral edge states. Okay? So this poses an interesting question. What is it about the insulator that guarantees that it has the helical edge states? So this is a question that I'll return to at the end.